Internal ballistics, also interior ballistics, a subfield of ballistics, is the study of the propulsion of a projectile. In guns internal ballistics covers the time from the propellant's ignition until the projectile exits the gun barrel. The study of internal ballistics is important to designers and users of firearms of all types, from small bore rifles and pistols, to high-tech artillery. For rocket-propelled projectiles, Internal ballistics covers the period during which a rocket motor is providing thrust. Parts and Equations Hatcher breaks the duration of interior ballistics into three parts. Lock time, the time from sear release until the primer is struck. Ignition time, the time from when the primer is struck until the projectile starts to move. Barrel time, the time from when the projectile starts to move until it exits the barrel. There are many processes that are significant. The source of energy is the burning propellant. It generates hot gases that raise the chamber pressure. That pressure pushes on the base of the projectile, and causes the projectile to accelerate. The chamber pressure depends on many factors. The amount of propellant that has burned, the temperature of the gases, and the volume of the chamber. The burn rate of the propellant depends not only on the chemical makeup but also on the shape of the propellant grains. The temperature depends not only on the energy released, but also the heat lost to the sides of the barrel and chamber. The volume of the chamber is continuously changing, as the propellant burns, there is more volume for the gas to occupy. As the projectile travels down the barrel, the volume behind the projectile also increases. There are still other effects. Some energy is lost in deforming the projectile and causing it to spin. There are also frictional losses between the projectile and the barrel. The projectile, as it travels down the barrel, compresses the air in front of it, which adds resistance to its forward motion. Models have been developed for these processes. These processes affect the gun design. The breech and the barrel must resist the high-pressure gases without damage. Although the pressure initially rises to a high value, the pressure starts dropping when the projectile has traveled some distance down the barrel. Consequently, the muzzle end of the barrel does not need to be as strong as the chamber end. There are five general equations used in interior ballistics. The equation of state of the propellant. The equation of energy. The equation of motion. The burning rate equation. The equation of the form function. History. Prior to the mid-1800s, before the development of electronics and the necessary mathematics, cellular, and material science to fully understand pressure vessel design, internal ballistics did not have a lot of detailed objective information. Barrels and actions would simply be built strong enough to survive a known overload, proof test, and muzzle velocity change could be surmised from the distance the projectile traveled. In the 1800s test barrels began to be instrumented. Holes were drilled in the barrel, crusher gauges using copper pellets were attached, the gun was fired, and the pressure was measured indirectly by how much the copper pellet was deformed. But the measurement only indicated the maximum pressure that was reached at that point in the barrel. By the 1960s, piezoelectric strain gauges were used. They allow instantaneous pressures to be measured and did not need a pressure port drilled into the barrel. More recently, using advanced telemetry and acceleration hardened sensors, instrumented projectiles were developed that could measure the pressure at the base of the projectile and its acceleration. Priming methods Through the years, several methods of igniting the propellant have been developed. Originally, a small hole, a touch hole, was drilled into the breech so that a fine propellant, black powder, the same propellant used in the gun, could be poured in, and an external flame or spark was applied, see match lock and flint lock. Later, percussion caps and self-contained cartridges, see cartridge, firearms, had primers that detonated after mechanical deformation, igniting the propellant. Electric current can also be used to ignite the propellant, see primer, firearm electric primed propellants black powder gunpowder black powder is a finely ground pressed and granulated mechanical pyrotechnic mixture of sulfur charcoal and potassium nitrate or sodium nitrate it can be produced in a range of grain sizes 
The size and shape of the grains can increase or decrease the relative surface area, and change the burning rate significantly. The burning rate of black powder is relatively insensitive to pressure, meaning it will burn quickly and predictably even without confinement, making it also suitable for use as a low explosive. It has a very slow decomposition rate, and therefore a very low brisance. It is not, in the strictest sense of the term, an explosive, but a deflagrant, as it does not detonate but decomposes by deflagration due to its subsonic mechanism of flame front propagation. Nitrocellulose, single base propellants. Nitrocellulose or gun cotton is formed by the action of nitric acid on cellulose fibers. It is a highly combustible fibrous material that deflagrates rapidly when heat is applied. It also burns very cleanly, burning almost entirely to gaseous components at high temperatures with little smoke or solid residue. Gelatinist nitrocellulose is a plastic, which can be formed into cylinders, tubes, balls, or flakes known as single base propellants. The size and shape of the propellant grains can increase or decrease the relative surface area, and change the burn rate significantly. Additives and coatings can be added to the propellant to further modify the burn rate. Normally, very fast powders are used for light bullet or low-velocity pistols and shotguns, medium-rate powders for magnum pistols and light rifle rounds, and slow powders for large-bore heavy rifle rounds. Double Base Propellants Nitroglycerin can be added to nitrocellulose to form double base propellants. Nitrocellulose desensitizes nitroglycerin to prevent detonation in propellant-sized grains, see dynamite, and the nitroglycerin gelatin ICs the nitrocellulose and increases the energy. Double base powders burn faster than single base powders of the same shape, though not as cleanly, and burn rate increases with nitroglycerin content. In artillery, ballastite or cordite has been used in the form of rods, tubes, slotted tube, perforated cylinder or multi-tubular, the geometry being chosen to provide the required burning characteristics. Round balls or rods, for example, are degressive burning because their production of gas decreases with their surface area as the balls or rods burn smaller, thin flakes are neutral burning, since they burn on their flat surfaces until the flake is completely consumed. The longitudinally perforated or multi-perforated cylinders used in large, long-barreled rifles or cannon are progressive burning, the burning surface increases as the inside diameter of the holes enlarges, giving sustained burning in a long, continuous push on the projectile to produce higher velocity without increasing the peak pressure unduly. Progressive burning powder compensates somewhat for the pressure drop as the projectile accelerates down the bore and increases the volume behind it. Solid Propellants, Caseless Ammunition A recent topic of research has been in the realm of caseless ammunition. In a caseless cartridge, the propellant is cast as a single solid grain, with the priming compound placed in a hollow at the base, and the bullet attached to the front. Since the single propellant grain is so large, most smokeless powders have grain sizes around 1 mm but a caseless grain will be perhaps 7 mm diameter and 15 mm long, the relative burn rate must be much higher. To reach this rate of burning, caseless propellants often use moderated explosives, such as RDX. Caseless ammunition might be considered a return to the mid-19th century, since the first practical cartridge repeater, the volcanic pistol, used a charge of black powder in a cavity in the bullet base. This weapon was the direct ancestor of the Henry and Winchester rifles, though they switched to metal-cased ammunition. Some early rifles and revolvers also used combustible paper cartridges, but they required a separate ignition system. The major advantages of a successful caseless round would be elimination of the need to extract and eject the spent cartridge case, permitting higher rates of fire and a simpler mechanism, and also reduced ammunition weight by eliminating the weight, and cost of the brass or steel case. While there is at least one experimental military rifle, the HNK G11, and one commercial rifle, the Vohr VEC91, that use caseless rounds, they have met with little success. One other commercial rifle was the Daisy VL rifle made by the Daisy Air Rifle Co. and chambered for .22 caliber caseless ammunition that was ignited by a hot blast of compressed air from the lever used to compress a strong spring like for an air rifle. 
The caseless ammunition is of course not reloadable, since there is no casing left after firing the bullet, and the exposed propellant makes the rounds less durable. Also, the case in a standard cartridge serves as a seal, keeping gas from escaping the breech. Caseless arms must use a more complex self-sealing breech, which increases the design and manufacturing complexity. Another unpleasant problem, common to all rapid-firing arms but particularly problematic for those firing caseless rounds, is the problem of rounds cooking off. This problem is caused by residual heat from the chamber heating the round in the chamber to the point where it ignites, causing an unintentional discharge. To minimize the risk of cartridge cook-off, machine guns can be designed to fire from an open bolt, with the round not chambered until the trigger is pulled, and so there is no chance for the round to cook off before the operator is ready. Such weapons could use caseless ammunition effectively. Open bolt designs are generally undesirable for anything but machine guns, the mass of the bolt moving forward causes the gun to lurch in reaction, which significantly reduces the accuracy of the gun, which is generally not an issue for machine gun fire. Propellant Charge Load Density and Consistency Load density is the percentage of the space in the cartridge case that is filled with powder. In general, loads close to 100% density, or even loads where seating the bullet in the case, compresses the powder, ignite and burn more consistently than lower density loads. In cartridges surviving from the black powder era, examples being 0.45 Colt, 0.45 to 70 Government, the case is much larger than is needed to hold the maximum charge of high-density smokeless powder. This extra room allows the powder to shift in the case, piling up near the front or back of the case and potentially causing significant variations in burning rate, as powder near the rear of the case will ignite rapidly but powder near the front of the case will ignite later. This change has less impact with fast powders. Such high capacity, Low-density cartridges generally deliver best accuracy with the fastest appropriate powder, although this keeps the total energy low due to the sharp high-pressure peak. Magnum pistol cartridges reverse this power-slash-accuracy trade-off by using lower density, slower burning powders that give high load density and a broad pressure curve. The downside is the increased recoil and muzzle blast from the high powder mass, and high muzzle pressure. Most rifle cartridges have a high load density with the appropriate powders. Rifle cartridges tend to be bottlenecked, with the wide base narrowing down to a smaller diameter, to hold a light, high-velocity bullet. These cases are designed to hold a large charge of low-density powder, for an even broader pressure curve than a magnum pistol cartridge. These cases require the use of a long rifle barrel to extract their full efficiency, although they are also chambered in rifle-like pistols, single shot or bolt action, with barrels of 10 to 15 inches, 25 to 38 centimeters. One unusual phenomenon occurs when dense, low-volume powders are used in large-capacity rifle cases. Small charges of powder, unless held tightly near the rear of the case by wadding, can apparently detonate when ignited, sometimes causing catastrophic failure of the firearm. The mechanism of this phenomenon is not well known, and generally it is not encountered except when loading low-recoil or low-velocity subsonic rounds for rifles. These rounds generally have velocities of under 1,100 feet s, 320 m s, and are used for indoor shooting, in conjunction with a suppressor or for pest control, where the power and muzzle blast of a full power round is not needed or desired. Chamber Straight vs bottleneck Straight walled cases were the standard from the beginnings of cartridge arms. With the low burning speed of black powder, the best efficiency was achieved with large, heavy bullets, so the bullet was the largest practical diameter. The large diameter allowed a short, stable bullet with high weight, and the maximum practical bore volume to extract the most energy possible in a given length barrel. There were a few cartridges that had long, shallow tapers, but these were generally an attempt to use an existing cartridge to fire a smaller bullet with a higher velocity and lower recoil. With the advent of smokeless powders, it was possible to generate far higher velocities by using a slow smokeless powder in a large volume case, pushing a small, light bullet. The odd, highly tapered 8mm level, 
made by necking down an older 11mm black powder cartridge, was introduced in 1886, and it was soon followed by the 7.92x57mm Mauser and 7x57mm Mauser military rounds, and the commercial .30-30 Winchester, all of which were new designs built to use smokeless powder. All of these have a distinct shoulder that closely resembles modern cartridges, and with the exception of the level they are still chambered in modern firearms even though the cartridges are over a century old. Aspect Ratio and Consistency When selecting a rifle cartridge for maximum accuracy, a short, fat cartridge with very little case taper may yield higher efficiency and more consistent velocity than a long, thin cartridge with a lot of case taper, part of the reason for a bottleneck design. Given current trends towards shorter and fatter cases, such as the new Winchester Super Short Magnum cartridges, it appears the ideal might be a case approaching spherical inside. Target and varmint hunting rounds require the greatest accuracy, so their cases tend to be short, fat and nearly untappered with sharp shoulders on the case. Short, fat cases also allow short action weapons to be made lighter and stronger for the same level of performance. The trade-off for this performance is fat rounds which take up more space in a magazine, sharp shoulders that do not feed as easily out of a magazine, and less reliable extraction of the spent round. For these reasons, when reliable feeding is more important than accuracy, such as with military rifles, longer cases with shallower shoulder angles are favored. There has been a long-term trend however, even among military weapons, towards shorter, fatter cases. The current 7.62x51mm NATO case replacing the longer .30-06 Springfield is a good example, as is the new 6.5 Grendel cartridge designed to increase the performance of the AR-15 family of rifles and carbines. Nevertheless, there is significantly more to accuracy and cartridge lethality than the length and diameter of the case, and the 7.62x51mm NATO has a smaller case capacity than the .30-06 Springfield, reducing the amount of propellant that can be used directly reducing the bullet weight and muzzle velocity combination that contributes to lethality, as detailed in the published cartridge specifications linked herein for comparison. The 6.5 Grendel, on the other hand, is capable of firing a significantly heavier bullet, C-Link, than the 5.56 NATO out of the AR-15 family of weapons, with only a slight decrease in muzzle velocity, perhaps providing a more advantageous performance trade-off. Friction and Inertia Static Friction and Ignition Since the burning rate of smokeless powder varies directly with the pressure, the initial pressure buildup, i.e. the shot start pressure, has a significant effect on the final velocity, especially in large cartridges with very fast powders and relatively lightweight projectiles. In small caliber firearms, the friction holding the bullet in the case, determines how soon after ignition the bullet moves and since the motion of the bullet increases the volume and drops the pressure, a difference in friction can change the slope of the pressure curve. In general, a tight fit is desired, to the extent of crimping the bullet into the case. In straight-walled rimless cases, such as the .45 ACP, an aggressive crimp is not possible, since the case is held in the chamber by the mouth of the case, but sizing the case to allow a tight interference fit with the bullet can give the desired result. In larger caliber firearms, the shot start pressure is often determined by the force required to initially engrave the projectile driving band into the start of the barrel rifling, smooth bore guns, which do not have rifling, achieve shot start pressure by initially driving the projectile into a forcing cone that provides resistance as it compresses the projectile obturation ring. Kinetic Friction the bullet must tightly fit the bore to seal the high pressure of the burning gunpowder. This tight fit results in a large frictional force. The friction of the bullet in the bore does have a slight impact on the final velocity, but that is generally not much of a concern. Of greater concern is the heat that is generated due to the friction. At velocities of about 300 m s, 980 feet s, lead begins to melt, and deposit in the bore. This lead buildup constricts the bore, increasing the pressure and decreasing the accuracy of subsequent rounds, and is difficult to scrub out without damaging the bore. Rounds, 
used at velocities up to 460 m s, 1500 feet s, can use wax lubricants on the bullet to reduce lead buildup. At velocities over 460 m s, 1500 feet s, nearly all bullets are jacketed in copper, or a similar alloy that is soft enough not to wear on the barrel, but melts at a high enough temperature to reduce buildup in the bore. Copper buildup does begin to occur in rounds that exceed 760 m s, 2500 feet s, and a common solution is to impregnate the surface of the bullet with molybdenum disulfide lubricant. This reduces copper buildup in the bore, and results in better long term accuracy. Large caliber projectiles also employ copper driving bands for rifled barrels for spin stabilized projectiles, however, Fin stabilized projectiles fired from both rifle and smooth bore barrels, such as the APFST's anti armor projectiles, employ nylon obturation rings that are sufficient to seal high pressure propellant gases and also minimize in bore friction, providing a small boost to muzzle velocity. The role of inertia In the first few centimeters of travel down the bore, the bullet reaches a significant percentage of its final velocity, even for high capacity rifles, with slow burning powder. The acceleration is on the order of tens of thousands of gravities, so even a projectile as light as 40 grains, 2.6 grams, can provide over 1000 newtons, 220 lbf, of resistance due to inertia. Changes in bullet mass, therefore, have a huge impact on the pressure curves of smokeless powder cartridges, unlike black powder cartridges. The loading or reloading of smokeless cartridges thus requires high precision equipment, and carefully measured tables of load data for given cartridges, powders, and bullet weights. Pressure Velocity Relationships Energy is imparted to the bullet in a firearm by the pressure of gases produced by burning propellant. While higher pressures produce higher velocities, pressure duration is also important. Peak pressure may represent only a small fraction of the time the bullet is accelerating. The entire duration of the bullet's travel through the barrel must be considered. Peak vs area Energy is defined as the ability to do work on an object, for example, the work required to lift a one-pound weight, one foot against the pull of gravity defines a foot-pound of energy, one joule is equal to the energy needed to move a body over a distance of one meter using one newton of force. If we were to modify the graph to reflect force, the pressure exerted on the base of the bullet multiplied by the area of the base of the bullet, as a function of distance, the area under that curve would be the total energy imparted to the bullet. Increasing the energy of the bullet requires increasing the area under that curve, either by raising the average pressure, or increasing the distance the bullet travels under pressure. Pressure is limited by the strength of the firearm, and duration is limited by barrel length. Propellant Design Propellants are carefully matched to firearm strength, chamber volume, and barrel length, and to bullet material, weight, and dimensions. The rate of gas generation is proportional to the surface area of burning propellant grains in accordance with Pyobert's law. Progression of burning from the surface into the grains is attributed to heat transfer from the surface of energy necessary to initiate the reaction. Smokeless propellant reactions occur in a series of zones or phases as the reaction proceeds from the surface into the solid. The deepest portion of the solid experiencing heat transfer melts and begins phase transition from solid to gas in a foam zone. The gaseous propellant decomposes into simpler molecules in a surrounding fizz zone. Endothermic transformations in the foam zone and fizz zone require energy initially provided by the primer and subsequently released in a luminous outer flame zone where the simpler gas molecules react to form conventional combustion products like steam and carbon monoxide. The heat transfer rate of smokeless propellants increases with pressure, so the rate of gas generation from a given grain surface area increases at higher pressures. Accelerating gas generation from fast-burning propellants may rapidly create a destructively high pressure spike before bullet movement increases reaction volume. Conversely, propellants designed for a minimum heat transfer pressure may cease decomposition into gaseous reactants if bullet movement decreases pressure before a slow-burning propellant has been consumed. Unburned propellant grains may remain in the barrel if the energy-releasing flame zone cannot be sustained in the resultant absence of gaseous reactants from the inner zones. 
propellant burnout. Another issue to consider, when choosing a powder burn rate, is the time the powder takes to completely burn versus the time the bullet spends in the barrel. Looking carefully at the left graph, there is a change in the curve, at about 0.8 milliseconds this is the point at which the powder is completely burned, and no new gas is created. With a faster powder, burnout occurs earlier, and with the slower powder, it occurs later. Propellant that is unburned when the bullet reaches the muzzle is wasted it adds no energy to the bullet, but it does add to the recoil and muzzle blast. For maximum power, the powder should burn until the bullet is just short of the muzzle. Since smokeless powders burn, not detonate, the reaction can only take place on the surface of the powder. Smokeless powders come in a variety of shapes, which serve to determine how fast they burn, and also how the burn rate changes as the powder burns. The simplest shape is a ball powder, which is in the form of round or slightly flattened spheres. Ball powder has a comparatively small surface area to volume ratio, so it burns comparatively slowly and as it burns, its surface area decreases. This means as the powder burns, the burn rate slows down. To some degree, this can be offset by the use of a retardant coating on the surface of the powder, which slows the initial burn rate and flattens out the rate of change. Ball powders are generally formulated as slow pistol powders, or fast rifle powders. Flake powders are in the form of flat, round flakes which have a relatively high surface area to volume ratio. Flake powders have a nearly constant rate of burn, and are usually formulated as fast pistol or shotgun powders. The last common shape is an extruded powder, which is in the form of a cylinder, sometimes hollow. Extruded powders generally have a lower ratio of nitroglycerin to nitrocellulose, and are often progressive burning that is, they burn at a faster rate as they burn. Extruded powders are generally medium to slow rifle powders. Muzzle pressure concerns. From the pressure graphs, it can be seen that the residual pressure in the barrel as the bullet exits is quite high, in this case over 16 capsa slash 110 MPA slash 1100 bar. While lengthening the barrel or reducing the amount of propellant gas will reduce this pressure, that often is not possible due to issues of firearm size and minimum required energy. Short-range target guns usually are chambered for .22 long rifle or .22 short, which have very tiny powder capacities and little residual pressure. When higher energies are required for long-range shooting, hunting, or anti-personnel use, high muzzle pressures are a necessary evil. With these high muzzle pressures come increased flash and noise from the muzzle blast, and, due to the large powder charges used, higher recoil. Recoil includes the reaction caused not just by the bullet, but also by the powder mass and speed, with the residual gases acting as a rocket exhaust. However, for a muzzle brake to be effective there must be significant muzzle pressure. General Concerns Bore Diameter and Energy Transfer A firearm, in many ways, is like a piston engine on the power stroke. There is a certain amount of high-pressure gas available and energy is extracted from it by making the gas move a piston in this case, the projectile is the piston. The swept volume of the piston determines how much energy can be extracted from the given gas. The more volume that is swept by the piston, the lower is the exhaust pressure, in this case, the muzzle pressure. Any remaining pressure at the muzzle or at the end of the engine's power stroke represents lost energy. To extract the maximum amount of energy, then, the swept volume is maximized. This can be done in one of two ways increasing the length of the barrel or increasing the diameter of the projectile. Increasing the barrel length will increase the swept volume linearly, while increasing the diameter will increase the swept volume as the square of the diameter. Since barrel length is limited by practical concerns to about arm's length for a rifle and much shorter for a handgun, increasing bore diameter is the normal way to increase the efficiency of a cartridge. The limit to bore diameter is generally the sectional density of the projectile, see external ballistics. Larger diameter bullets of the same weight have much more drag, and so they lose energy more quickly after exiting the barrel. In general, most handguns use bullets between 0.355, 9mm, and 
11.5 mm, caliber, while most rifles generally range from 0.223, 5.56 mm, to 0.328 mm, caliber. There are many exceptions, of course, but bullets in the given ranges provide the best general purpose performance. Handguns use the larger diameter bullets for greater efficiency in short barrels, and tolerate the long-range velocity loss since handguns are seldom used for long-range shooting. Handguns designed for long-range shooting are generally closer to shortened rifles than to other handguns. Ratio of propellant to projectile mass Another issue, when choosing or developing a cartridge, is the issue of recoil. The recoil is not just the reaction from the projectile being launched, but also from the powder gas, which will exit the barrel with a velocity even higher than that of the bullet. For handgun cartridges, with heavy bullets and light powder charges, a 9x19mm, for example, might use 5 grains, 320 mg, of powder, and a 115 grains, 7.5 grams, bullet. The powder recoil is not a significant force, for a rifle cartridge, a .22 to 250 Remington, using 40 grains, 2.6 grams, of powder and a 40 grains, 2.6 grams, bullet, the powder can be the majority of the recoil force. There is a solution to the recoil issue, though it is not without cost. A muzzle brake or recoil compensator is a device which redirects the powder gas at the muzzle, usually up and back. This acts like a rocket, pushing the muzzle down and forward. The forward push helps negate the feel of the projectile recoil by pulling the firearm forwards. The downward push, on the other hand, helps counteract the rotation imparted by the fact that most firearms have the barrel mounted above the center of gravity. Overt Combat Guns, Large Bore High Powered Rifles, Long Range Handguns Chambered for Rifle Ammunition, and action shooting handguns designed for accurate rapid fire, all benefit from muzzle brakes. The high powered firearms use the muzzle brake mainly for recoil reduction, which reduces the battering of the shooter by the severe recoil. The action shooting handguns redirect all the energy up to counteract the rotation of the recoil, and make F. Please subscribe and thanks for watching.